as I have taken the time to put together this message, this sermon series, I've learned a lot of things about me and I've realized a lot of things about me. And because of my gifts and talents, I have realized that I have stood on many stages and I have probably preached to several thousands of people. I have traveled the country and I have seen many come to Christ. God has given me a gift and talent to communicate and share his word. And I am thankful that I have been able to do many things that has bought him glory. But even in all of that, I have learned that I am not what I do. And you may be here and have a good job. You may be here with secure financial stability. You may be here with blessed and ravishing good looks. You may have healthy relationships. You may have great gifts and talents, but I want to let you know that you too are not the things that you do. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I don't know about you, but I can definitely relate to John chapter 8 when the woman was caught red-handed in sin. And I've learned that Nothing I do is ever hidden from God, so I've always been caught red-handed in sin. And I've also been like Peter, boastful, confident in my own abilities, confident in, my, in myself. And I have said to the Lord, I would never do this and I would never do that, only to do the things that I said I would never do. But I've also learned that God says... I am not what I have done. Because we are all sinners, I know that we all have broken the heart of God by our actions. But praise be to that same God whose word states in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 8. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our sins, all according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us with wisdom and insight. Praise be to that God that knows my sins and mistakes, that knows what others have done to me. And despite all of those things, he still calls me righteous. And when I have fallen, he extends me another opportunity to rise again. And I am not saying these things to you for pity. I'm saying it because it is true. But I grew up in a home where I was told that I really wouldn't amount to anything. I have had countless times where people have made snap judgments on me based off my skin color. I have heard so many things that people have had to say about me. But as I have grown closer to Jesus over all of these years, I have been able to recognize and realize that I am not the sum of what people say. And many of you know what I'm talking about. Many of you know what it feels like to be labeled by others and judged by others and condemned by others. But this morning I stand and I tell you that identity can only come from the creator. And seeing how the world or the people that have labeled you did not create you, they can never define you or accurately identify you. Therefore, you too are not the sum of what people say. So if you are not these things, then who are you? The Bible gives a clear-cut answer to this question. John chapter 1 verse 12 says this, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. To those who have heard the gospel message, to those who have recognized their own transgressions and realized that they were far from where God had called them to be, to those who come to the recognition that they needed a savior who could save them from the penalty of their sin, and they realized that God the Father sent his one and only son into the world to die for their sins and be the path of redemption to set us back in right standing with God. To those who believe and have accepted that, you have been given the right to become children of God. And this right cannot be stripped away, taken from your grasp. It cannot be rescinded if you believe in who Jesus is and accepted what Jesus has done then today I declare and I encourage you, challenge you to take hold of who you are. 
You are a child of God. You are not what you do. You are not what you've done. You are not what they say. You are what he says that you are. You are a child of God. Galatians 3.26 says this. So in Christ Jesus, you all are children of God through faith. And there's a part that I just want to focus on in that scripture. And the part that I want to take a moment and focus on is the part that says through faith. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says this. God has given each man a measure of faith. So all of us have a certain level of faith. And the reality is we are all trying to figure out where to put that measure of faith at. I'm going to say that again. God has given each man a measure of faith. This is what it says in Romans chapter 12 verse 3. And all of us have this measure of faith. And we're trying to figure out where do we place that measure of faith at. I want to relay that to this, this bottle of water. This would be our measure of faith. We all have a measure of faith. Some people's measure is different from the next, but we all have a measure of faith. And the truth is, we've tried to take this measure of faith and we've placed it in other things many times. For some of us, we've taken this measure of faith and we've placed it in ourselves. I'm going to bank on me. I'm going to ride with me. I'm going to count on me. Then we've learned that we are faulty people and banking on ourselves doesn't really get the job done in a well way. Others of us have, have taken this measure of faith that God has given us, and we've decided to bank on other people. I'm going to count on them. I'm going to give my all to them. I'm going to trust in them. I'm going to believe in them. I'm going to take this measure of faith that I have, and I'm putting it in this person. But all of us at some point in time in life have learned that people are faulty and can let us down. We tend to bank our measure of faith on things like our health. We bank our, our measure of faith on things like our, our finances and, and so many other different things. We bank our, 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 our measure of faith on our children, on our dreams, on, on what we can do. And that's what we do with this measure of faith. And some of us, we have a lot of faith left. Some of us have a measure of faith, and, and we feel good about where we're at with our measure of faith. But others of us, we, we barely got any measure left. We barely got any faith left in the tank. And we are trying to guard it and protect it with everything we've got. We're not, we're not banking it on ourselves anymore because we realize ourselves let us down. We're not banking it on other people because we don't want to trust it anymore, trust in anyone anymore. We've been hurt. We've been scarred. We've been batter, battered and bruised by other people. We don't want to trust in finances. We don't want to trust in the job. So now we got this measure of faith and we're just clinging to it, protecting it. We've built walls around it. We, we don't want to do anything with the measure of faith, we just want to hold on to it. But there is something greater than just clinging to that measure of faith and doing nothing with it. I am speaking to the people in this room who have never, never given their life to Christ, who have never had a relationship with Jesus. This is what I want to tell you. I want to tell you that there is a man who saw you in your weakest week, in your lowest slow, at your most broken state, in the middle of your greatest darkness, in the middle of your greatest depression, when you had no desire to love God, no desire to connect with who he was. And he saw you from heaven, and he didn't like that distance. I literally picture this man, Jesus who would see you in all the challenges and difficulties that you are facing. He would see you heartbroken, barely any faith left to give that God has given you that measure of. And, and he would see that. And I literally vision Jesus saying, let me take off my crown. Set aside my robe. Step off this throne. And I will come and I will meet you there. And that's what he did. That's what he did, and he says, with that little bit of measure of faith that you have, he comes and he, he knocks on your door. He begins to tap on the doors of your heart, and he's not trying to pry it out of your hands, but he's trying to speak to you and say, I see that you've poured your 
measure of faith out on many other things. I see that you poured your measure of faith out on many other people, but I am someone that you can trust with your measure of faith. We become children of God through faith and with this faith that we have when we take that measure and we place it in Jesus, that is when the transformation and the transition happens. This is what it says in Romans chapter 10 verse 11. So those who believed in him, those who put their faith in him, that measure of faith that we just talked about, those who put their faith in him have never been disappointed. They have never been put to shame. If you are in this room with a little bit of faith, in this room, you've been through some battles and scars. In, in this room, you've gone through some things, and, and you've heard many people talk about Jesus, but you've never given it your all. You've never taken all the faith that you have and placed it in his hands. The Bible tells us those who have placed their faith in him have never been disappointed. They have never been put to shame. And some of you know what it's like to put your faith in you, to put your faith in things, to put your th faith in people, and walk away and feel shamed. But that is not what happens when you take your measure of faith and place it in Jesus. Today, as you hear this word of God, I, I encourage you, as you ponder, as the Spirit speaks to your heart, I dare you to trust in the Lord. I dare you to put your measure of faith in him and see what he will do in your life. There are many great blessings that come along with being a child of God. And the Bible lists plenty of them. But you want to know what I believe the greatest blessing to be while being, by being a child of God? The greatest ble blessing that I truly believe in being a child of God is the fact that God is our father. When, when we are children of God, that means that God is now our father. There is no greater blessing than that. Let me, let me, let me uh, share with you some things about the character of God. But before I do that, I want to say it is such a beautiful thing that the God of the universe would be called our father. And I'm going to be honest, it breaks my heart to see fatherless children in my line of work. I, I see a lot of them in, in, in what I do through youth ministry and just in my life. And one of the greatest joys and blessings that I have is personally watching my father uh, wrestle and play with my little brothers. It's, it's so exciting when he does that. I just laugh and giggle and I look at the relationship that they have when they are having that type of interaction with our dad, they wrestle with him, they tackle him, they laugh, they giggle, and it's a joyful moment and experience because they know that he loves them. They know that he has their back. They know that there was nothing that my father wouldn't do for them. And I missed out on that as a kid. And it saddens me to know that there are people in this room, people in our lives that are missing out on that type of care from their earthly fathers. And to every man in this room, if you have a son, do not... Do not forsake the opportunity to be a father. But because I missed out on that opportunity as a young man, it has made my relationship with God that much more sweeter. I just want to share with you some things that the Bible says about God. And I'm not going to give you every scripture reference, but I promise you the word of God says this. And if you dive into it for yourself, you'll see it to be true. The Bible says that he is faithful that he keeps his promises, that he is forgiving, slow to anger and patient, that he is gracious and merciful, full of compassion. He is strong and mighty, all-powerful and all-knowing. He is everywhere. He is holy and unable to lie. He is pure and righteous. He is caring. He is kind. He is light. He is love. He is spirit and truth. He is alive. He is God. He is able. And that is your father. That is something to be joyful and exciting over. All of these things that are incredible about God and so much more for those who have accepted Christ and have become children through him, 
this God, this entity, this being, he is your father. That excites me to know that all these characteristics, these character traits about God. And then I get to call that person my father. The greatest blessing about being a child of God is that God is your father. God is your father. The basis of this sermon series was so that us, those who call themselves Christians, those who proclaim Jesus is their Lord, but do not have a clear understanding of who they are in Christ, it is so that we can come to a greater knowledge of who we are in him, how he sees us. And that has been my prayer as I have preached every message, is that as children of God, as those who are in Christ, we would understand how he views us from his perspective. The Bible gives many clear specifics about those who are in Christ Jesus. And I just want to highlight a few. The first one says, uh, uh, sorry, the first one I want to highlight is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that says, therefore there is, sorry, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. For those who are in Christ, there is a newness to your life. You are not physically reborn, but you are spiritually reborn. John chapter 3, verse 5 through 7 says this. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. If you have given your life to Christ, you have had a spiritual awakening that declares that your flesh is no longer in control, but the spirit of the living God now dwells in me. Jesus tells us at the end of, John, at the end of verse 7 in John chapter 3 that you must be born again. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 16, it gives a clear reason as to why. It says this in the scripture. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery that returns you to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. See, when you give your life to Christ and you become reborn, you become made new, God's spirit is then deposited in you. And that spirit begins to testify with him, you are my child. So when we're going through different battles and we're going through different struggles and the foundation of our identity is that, that I am a child of God, the spirit that he has placed inside of you is testifying that back to him in heaven. And that is why we must go through the process of, of being baptized and being reborn again. It's so important for us to allow God's spirit to begin to dwell in us. Because it is what testifies, what speaks on our behalf, what declares to us in our moments when we are lost and struggling with identity. You are a child of God. And I take a moment to encourage you that coming up soon, if you are in this room, and you have given your life to the Lord, you are living for the Lord, and you have never been baptized, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing to have your sins washed away, to have yourself cleansed as you do what Jesus commands us to do. We have a baptism service coming up on November 3rd, and I encourage you to, to, to dwell on that, to allow God's Spirit to guide you into that, that you would go through the process of being born of water and spirit again. That his spirit may testify with you that you are a child of God. The next thing that I want to highlight about in Christ Jesus says this. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Zero. No condemnation. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. John chapter 3, verse 17. But I want to make this so, so clear. And I'm preaching this to myself right now. This is not a free pass to go on sinning. 
because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that does not mean that we get to go and do whatever we want. The Bible clearly says that we do not continue sinning so that grace can abound more. For how can we continue to live in sin if we have died to it? It's found in Romans chapter 6. So when the word says in Romans 8, 1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, it is not a sin and get away with it card. It is a reminder to those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who are striving to deny the flesh daily, to those who are striving to honor God with your life, striving not to let the old self be alive, to those that are in the day-to-day -day battle trying to live for the Lord, yet you make mistakes, you still fight to overcome your sin. God says, I do not condemn you and keep going and rise again. To give you some more, the Bible says that you have been made alive in Christ Jesus, that there is redemption in Christ Jesus, that there is freedom in Christ Jesus. The Bible says you were called in Christ Jesus. You were created for good works in Christ Jesus. There is so much more that the word of God says about those who are in Christ Jesus. Those of us who have given our lives to him, ourselves to him, we have been made new. We have come alive. We have been redeemed. We have not been condemned. And we are not condemned. We have been set free and called in Christ Jesus to do good works in Christ Jesus. Praise be to the Son of God who died so that we might become sons and daughters of God. But I do want to take a moment and highlight this. That if we are coming to the full recognition that we are children of God, how important it is to build a relationship with your father. How important it is to know your dad. How important it is to understand his heart. How important it is to reveal yourself to him, to allow him into your heart. Many times we, we will seek to know who God is, but we don't allow God to seek to know who we are. And I know that the word of God says that he knows everything, but God is not looking to uh, just know everything. He wants you to share your heart with him. He wants, to share, wants you to share who you are with him. He wants you to willingly relate with him. It is so important to build that relationship with your father now that you recognize that you are a child of God. It's a beautiful thing to be a child. As we stood up here and we did dedications, I was just in awe as I watched how my man Albert held his son Lincoln and how Lincoln was just so peaceful, so calm, so relaxed. Despite all that was going on around him, he was secure in his father's arms. What was happening is that the relationship between father and son was being kindled and developed. It was growing in that moment. And that is what I believe our father in heaven desires of us. That we, he, we would allow him to hold, he, we would allow him to hold us in his arms to keep us secure despite what is going on around us, despite the things that we are facing, the difficulties that are taking place, that we would just be held in his arms and be at peace, trusting in whose arms we are in, trusting in our Father. I can't stress it enough. If we are children of God, then we must know who our Father is is the greatest blessing about being a child of God is that God is our father. So I say all I have to say to bring this all to a close. As we talked about our identity, as we have dispelled the things that the world has said to us, the things that we have said to ourselves, as we've recognized that the things that we do cannot define us, as we recognize the things that we've done, the mistakes that we've made do not define us. As we recognize that people will always try to put labels on us, but God in his presence can remove those labels. It comes back to one thing. What I believe to be 
the most beautiful transaction between father and son is when Jesus gets baptized in Matthew chapter 3. And he goes under the water. And he comes out from under the water. The heavens tear open with pride and joy. And the spirit descends down on him. And the father speaks to his son. He says, this is my son. He does not mention anything that Jesus will do. He does not mention that Jesus would die on a cross. He does not mention that Jesus would be the savior of the world. He does not mention that Jesus would redeem mankind. He just simply mentions, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Nothing left to be said. So this morning, we ask ourselves, Who am I? Who are we? What is my identity? There is only one proper way that I believe that we need to learn and we need to cling to from here on out. Is to identify ourselves to ourselves and to identify ourselves to the world. I would say this. I am a child of God who has been born again, saved by grace, set free from sin, His spirit testifies so, that I am his son, that I am his his daughter, whom he loves with me, he is well pleased. That is my identity in Christ. And all of that, all of this has been made possible, all because of Christ Jesus. That's the only way all of these things are possible, because of Christ Jesus. So with that being said, I invite you to stand to your feet. And when you do so, and you have that deep appreciation that God is your father, that you are a child of God, would you lift your voices to the heavens and thank Jesus for what he has done, allowing you to be a son and a daughter of God. Let's give Jesus some praise.